a sermon entitled, What in Hell Do You Want? <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes you got to make a decision. You know, the book of Jude said that some people will come to Christ because of his love and his mercy. But um, it's in the 20s, verse somewhere in the 20s, it says, but some of them you got to scare, snatching them from the very fire to the, the, the to, to eliminate them from the very defiling garments of sin of flesh. So, so how many of you know sometimes you got to be scared straight? Hallelujah. So that's what we did. Hallelujah. We scared the hell out of them. Amen. Literally, I'm not cussing. I'm not cussing. Literally, hallelujah, brought them into life evermore. Well, I'm very excited about uh, today. I'm very excited about today. There's two things I want to do before I get into the message this morning. Number one, how many of you have been watching the news or you've heard the news of everything happening over in the Middle East over this season? Listen, this is not, this is not a political war. This is not even a um, physical war. This is a very spiritual thing that's taking place. And, and I don't do this very often, but this coming Wednesday night, I'm going to teach. Uh, I've asked Troy, our elders, Troy and Tisha, to give me the platform um, this Wednesday. And I want to teach on Israel and, and the significance, the role of Israel and how Israel fits in. Listen, the blessings of Israel has not been transferred to the church. The church has been grafted into the people, the men and women of promise. And with all of the craziness that's happening in our nation, let me, let me, let me pause here. God is not anti-Arab. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is as pro-Palestinian as anyone. That while we were dead in our trespasses, he still died. But to be pro one thing is not to be anti another. And the reason why most of us are anti is because we don't understand the biblical spiritual significance. And you know whose fault it is? It's not these kids running around here acting crazy. Mom and dad were either uneducated or ignorant to the fact that they were raising a bunch of ignorant people. And they don't understand the significance. You ain't got to amen me. I'm tired. Hallelujah. Do you hear what I'm saying? And to this Wednesday, I'm going to teach on Israel. I'm going to teach on its significance. Mm, I feel it welling up in me even now in this moment. i got to behave. And so I would invite you. I would invite you to come Wednesday night for our kingdom class. And, and I want us to unlock the significance of, of Israel. Where did Israel come from in 1948 when it became a, a state it was prophetic. It was prophecy that was being fulfilled that set us up for the end times. Uh, this word Hamas, okay, this, this terror group Hamas, it means in the Hebrew violence. It is not all Palestinians, but it is a segment of Palestinians. Palestinians did not exist in the Bible in terms of Palestinian. They existed in the Bible in terms of Philistines. Hallelujah. So to, uh, I got to be careful. So to be pro-Palestinian is like you standing at the battle in the Valley of Elah and not being pro-David, being pro-Goliath. So we have to understand. We have to spiritually understand, put our, put our ears on to understand what's happening. And I just want to unlock some things um, this Wednesday night. Seven o'clock right here at the church. Oh, there's my picture. Good Lord. Didn't know we were doing that. Okay, hallelujah. Just in case you didn't know who I was. <laughs> Jesus, I was not prepared for that image. Don't have the same shirt on, do I? Okay, good. And so I want to uh, do that this coming Wednesday night. The other thing is next Sunday is our For His House offering. And for the last eight weeks, I've been talking about it. I've been setting us up to um, really in, make an investment. Wasn't it exciting to see the, uh, the concrete poured, hardening outside today? Amen. <clears throat> the foundation is set. There are 14 footers that, that are holding that concrete together. Underneath every one of those footers is a Bible. Underneath every one of those footers is a Bible because this thing can't be built on anything except the Word of the Lord. And so I'm very excited. Um, uh, uh, last year, about a year and a half ago, I preached on I'm about to throw my shoe. And we wrote prophecies, prophetic promises on those shoes. And, and we threw shoes saying that, Lord, we believe we're going to possess those promises. 
where, where the altar will be in this new building. Right before the gravel was laid, we have images I'll show you next Sunday. Right before they laid the gravel, we laid every one of those prophecies side by side by side across the altar, what will be the altar area. Come on. Somebody, somebody told me, and I had dinner with them. And somebody said, man, when we get to worshiping and praising in the altar, we're going to be bouncing on all that foam. I said, get your praise on. Hallelujah. It's going to be a good thing. And so next Sunday, um, we're going to have our For His House offering. I invite you to be obedient to what Holy Spirit would have you do. We're believing for $350,000 to come in. We're believing that by faith, whether the ones in the room, somebody watching online, people watching online. Literally, this message today will reach over a million people, 108 nations around the world. To God be the glory for that. But we're believing that God's going to continue. Listen, we're not going to get into this new building and stop. We're more, that's more room for more power, more room for more presence. We're not, we're not going to end this thing. We're just getting started. Amen? Before I get into the message, I want to show you a video. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions that happen every Wednesday night in our growth track, um, if you don't know a whole lot, about, whole, whole lot about our church, we have every Wednesday night we have this thing called growth track, and it gives you a working knowledge of who we are. Because this is a, a date, and we need to figure out if we're going to be in covenant with each other. See, most people pick churches, but sometimes churches need to pick you. So it's important to know who we are. It's important to know who you are and see if God is dovetailing our destinies together for such a time as this. We do spiritual gifts tests and all these things. In, in one of the weeks, we go around the room. Our elders who teach these classes go around the room, and they ask the question, why Judah? Why, why is it that God sent you here? And that's a very important question. Maybe this is your first time. You need to understand why you're here. And if you're here because you were mad at the last place you were, that's not a good reason to be here. Y'all not going to preach with me today, are you? Because here's what I've learned. How you exit determines how you enter. You understand? You need to know why you're here, why God has brought you here. And I promise you, he didn't bring you here to sit on your blessed assurance. Come on, this is a serving church, and we serve... And I want to show you a video of one of the amazing couples in our church, and, and here's a testimony of their why Judah. You have that for me? Hi, I'm Joe. And I'm Nancy. And, and this, this is, is our why Judah. Judah. So we've been Christians for 43 years, and, and we jumped in deep that from day one we wanted to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so the church we attend is important. Uh, we talked about should we go see any other churches, but after attending church at Judah for the first time, there was no need. It was actually everything we were looking for. And we said, we can get excited about going to church again, which was awesome. Right. The Holy Spirit was there. He led the church. Uh, the pastor didn't really care if the, he was running over. He would just say, well, he did, but he was conscious of it. But he'd say, who am I to cut off the Holy Spirit because of a time? Who does that? That's impressive, you know? Um, I do love Judah Church. Um, it's exciting to go. We, we actually go to Judah Church and um, we, we are equipped. And it seems like every Sunday that we, we get a deeper understanding of who Jesus is, the mm -hmm. page turns, the veil is removed, and we see something new and we walk out and say, wow, that's the best service we ever attended. I also believe that Judah Church is a church for such a time as this in a world where you know our youth and even adults are checking YouTube for the answers. Judah Church remains a light to say, no, Jesus Christ is the answer, mm -hmm. the Word of God, you know, uh, is the answer and the Holy Spirit in you if you're led will lead you to the right answer exactly. so it's an amazing church where time is this it is I think as we build bigger to contain uh, more people the Holy Spirit's going to continue to draw people there and we really don't have to do much except to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to bring the people He wants. I'm excited that I'm in a church that has Jesus as the center and is growing and decisions are being made for um, getting the functionality we need to have more people to grow, to have more room, um, you know, in the queuing area. So when we come in, uh, people don't have to go out another door so we can rub elbows with everyone.
Well, we know that um, November 5th is an exciting day. It's for the house offering. And so what we're doing right now is we're praying and saying, Lord, what do you want? And what should we give? Because, you know, the Lord is concerned where we place our money, you know, and he wants to place it in good soil that's going to grow. And so you should take that seriously. Lord, where do you want me to place it? At least we've learned to, through mistakes, is, Lord, what do you want? And that's what causes the growth, you know, and, and that's what's going to be fun to watch, you know. Anybody excited about what God's doing? Amen. Just ask you to be obedient to what Holy Spirit would have you do next Sunday in all three of our services. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm 47. We're in this series entitled The Tribe of Judah, and I want to preach to you for just a few minutes on the, the, the thought, subtitled this message, A Victorious Praise. How many of you want to have victory in your life? Four of us, hallelujah. How many of you want to have victory in your life? How many don't want to live in defeat? How many, who, how many are not wanting just to get by? Getting by is not the standard for your life, but you want to walk in the fullness. How many of you want to walk in every promise that the Lord has for your life? How many want to see every one of them to come to fruition? That you don't want to just live in potential. You don't want to just live in the possibility of what could be. And I know our eyes haven't seen and our ear hasn't heard, and it's never even entered into our heart, but I want to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Am I by myself today? It is my desire. It is my desire to see victory in my life, in my wife's life, in my kids' life, in my church's life, in my home's life, in my neighborhood's life, in my job's life. I want to walk in the fullness of every victory that has been afforded to me. I want to walk postured in those victories. Am I by myself today? Today, I want us to move into actual postures of praise actual postures of praise and, and and hear me today by way of introduction I need you to understand that postures expressions demonstrations of praise th these are not ethnically culturally contextualized expressions let me say that to you again these are not ethnically culturally contextualized expressions in other words, this ain't just for black folk. This ain't just for Pentecostal folk. This ain't just for expressive folk. This ain't just for extroverted folk. These are not expressions. These are commands. Deeper realms of God's presence and or the unlocking of promises happen when any believer finds themselves operating in a spirit of praise. So it doesn't matter whether you're the kind of person that talks out loud or demonstrates out loud, extroverted, introverted, come from a background of Pentecostal charismatics, um, or, or come from a, a very liturgical background, it doesn't matter. What matters is the posture of praise that your heart is being pushed in. Psalm 47 says it this way. To clap your hands, most you people. To clap your hands, only Pentecostal people. To clap your hands, only deeply religious people. To clap your hands, only extroverted people. No, he says to clap your hands, all ye, I'm a King James boy, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Uh-oh, this is already telling me from the beginning that the posture of my praise must be one of clapping and one of shouting. In other words, this ain't going to be a quiet thing that's about to happen. This is not like we're on the golf course and, and Tiger just sunk the putt. Hallelujah. We're not giving him golf clap praise. We're going to come in and understand the significance of who he is. Watch this. Clapping and shouting are expressions of praise, but they are not praise themselves. Let me say it again. Clapping and shouting are not praise. They are expressions of praise. Praise is solely dependent upon your heart posture. You can clap, but if your heart is not in it, it is not praise. I don't care if you clap on rhythm. I don't care if you clap off rhythm. I don't care if you know how to clap, 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 clap. Or I don't care if you know if you're happy, you know it, clap your hands and you can't get the rhythm together. If your heart is not postured as focused on the Lord, you may be clapping, but it is not praise. 
You may be shouting, but it is not praise because it is based upon our heart posture. I think so many times God gets in our church services and he sits there and the Spirit of God looks at what we're doing and, man, and looks and says, man, that's really good. That's really beautiful. I wish it was for me. I'm tired, so it's going to be frisky today, okay? I wonder how many times God looks at the way we give praise and looks down and says, man, I wish that was for me. But most often we see it, especially in church, people know how to do their praise, they know how to do their dance, they know how to do their shout, they know how to do their song, they know how to do their instrument, but their heart is not postured in the position of honoring God. And God looks and goes, why can't you just do that for me? Why do you have to be seen? Why do you have to watch with, to see if anybody else is watching? Watch this. These are the reactions of praise. They are not praise. When I think about the goodness of the Lord, when I think about how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. Listen, by the time it's over with, I'll probably be clapping my hands. When I think about how he rescued me, how he made a way for me, when he, when he healed my son of scoliosis, when I begin to think about the goodness of the Lord and how he brought, it may bring out a clap, but the clap is not the praise. The clap is the reaction of the praise that's already going on. on the, do you hear what I'm saying today? Day. My shout may be welling up on the inside of me, and like an air compressor, it's billowing. I can yell, and I can even get you to yell, but just yelling doesn't mean it's praise. Does it, it's a reaction of praise. In Psalm 47, he gives us two postures of praise, of reactions of praise, based upon our heart posture. Number one is clap. In the Hebrew, this word is taqwa. And this word literally means the act of affirmation. When I'm clapping my hands, I am affirming who God is or what God says is mine. It, it literally means to bring it down from heaven, the promises that are assigned to me. If you're glad to be in the house, we say things like this, if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, Come on, put your hands together. Don't do it literally in this moment. Put your hands together. And I wonder how many of us are clapping because the preacher said it versus our heart posture being, you know, there was a day in my life if I had to walk through the doors of a church, that whole thing would have fell in. So I'm glad that I'm in the house of the Lord and he didn't strike me dead walking in here. I'm glad I'm in the house of the Lord. When my heart is postured the way, the right way, I'll think of scriptures like I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. When my heart is postured the right way and I put my hands together, I'm not up here clapping for the kids with their presentation. But their kid's presentation is, is sparking me, it's wooing me, it's drawing me to remember that there were seasons in my life when I wasn't sure God was with me. But here I am still sitting. Here I am still standing. Here I am still worshiping. And even in very difficult seasons, there may be tears in my eyes, but if he didn't fail me back then, he's not going to fail me right now. Therefore, they're pushing me. And yes, it's cute. And yes, Yes, it's awesome to see them beginning to understand and walk in their gifting and their calling. But what praise is, is not thanking God that a bunch of kids are synchronized. Praise is saying, God, these kids are teaching me that out of the mouths you've ordained praise. And they're reminding me that the righteous have never been forsaken. And his seed has never had to go for bread. And even in the biggest hell of my life, these kids are reminding me. That's why I can put my hands together. Yes, it was polished. Yes, it was professional. Yes, it looked good. But more than that, I put my hands together and say, God, I want to bring down your provision. I want to bring down the fact you're the refuge of my life. I clap my hands in expectation because my heart is postured the right way. This is an expression of praise that is in awe of God and that his promises are actually for me. I don't know if you get this, but in my mind, I think, 
why in the world would you do that for me? Me, for real? As many times as I tried to manipulate you, as many times in, as in the name of spirituality I was being selfish, as many times as I tried to draw your attention to my situation because I needed backup for my plan, And you still love me and you give me the promises. It's yes. Y'all, next Sunday, the Glenn in me is freaking out. Because there's like 12 balls sitting in the tube. It ain't your house they're coming after. Uh, let's see, some of y'all can't handle this. This is what you call real. But the God in me is saying, if I brought you this far, if you'll stay out of my way, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against what I build. You won't have to not sleep. <laughs> because unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Stop using your vanity. Okay. Okay. So we get in moments, and, and I, I call it puny praise. I call it puny praise. Do you, do you know what puny praise is? Is when we're in a situation, and we're so comfortable, and somebody in the pulpit is preaching the promises of God, and then he says, why don't you put your hands together and give God praise that is for you? And, and, and it's not important enough to get your arm from around your significant other. So you give him a pew praise. Or you're so tired because you stayed up to watch Carolina lose last night that you don't want to engage. So when the preacher says, clap your hands together, you say, Lord, I received that for me. I'm just so tired. So we give him the Knee praise. Pew, knee. Praise. Puny praise. We're saying, I'm going to engage, but I'm not giving you maximum effort. What we're really saying is, God, I want you to give me maximum effort, but I'm not going to give you maximum effort. I I'm going to remain in my flesh. When I taqua, what I'm saying is, your promise is yes for me. Your promise is amen for me. And whether it was in a song, whether it was in a drama, whether it was in that word, whether it was in that prayer, or whether I'm reading that Bible and I recognize a promise, I'm saying, Lord, because you are mine, that promise is mine. Because you belong to me, that promise belongs to me. I clap my hands because I say yes. I'm calling heaven down to the earth realm, and I'm saying you are worthy, you are worthy, and I thank you that it is mine, it is mine. I thank you that it is mine because you are mine. I thank you because you save, you raise, you heal, you deliver, and I praise you. I praise you with the sound of my clap. I pray, I talk while you, Lord. I talk while you. I talk while you because you are greatly to be taquad. I'm not giving you puny taqua. I'm giving you great taqua because you've been great in your promises. I'm going to be great in my praise today. I talk while before the Lord today. This is why we clap. This is why we clap. We clap because we're pulling down every promise. We clap until we see it manifest in the natural realm. We clap our hands and say, until I see the fullness of that goodness in the land of the living, I will bless you at all times, and your, your praise will continually be in my mouth. 
This taqwa is so important. But it is not unique to just us. In Isaiah chapter 55, 11 and 12, the Bible tells us, look at verse 12 for the sake of time, that the mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing and all of the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Y'all, I didn't even know trees had hands. But because God is the one who created them and he's the one who spoke this word into existence, every time they wave their hand, every time you hear a tree limb break, every time you hear a crack or a rustle of the wind through those leaves, do you understand what all of these trees are doing? They're saying, you created me. You formed me. This is still yours and I belong to you. Nature is applauding his majesty. In the book of Psalm chapter 98, verse 7 and 8, it says, let the sea roar and all of the animals on the inside of the sea begin to war, roar. The world and those who dwell in it. Look at verse 8. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills be joyful together. What is he saying? He's saying not only do the trees clap their hands, but also the waters clap their hands. I didn't even know the waters had hands, but because he spoke the water into existence, he gave them hands and every time you hear it, smack up against a rock. Every time you hear it, smack up against the shoreline. What is it saying? It's saying that when you spoke me into existence, you're still God. Yes, there's all this other kind of stuff, but you're the God that created me and spoke me into existence, and nature is applauding. The waters is applauding. How much more, y'all? He spoke the trees into existence. He spoke the water into existence, but he formed me with his hands. He fashioned me into his likeness. He put his hands to me. The least I can do is put my hands back to him and say, thank you. I talk while you today. We clap our hands because according to Hebrew, we talk why, because it is the act of affirmation. I am affirming who he is and every promise that he has assigned to my life. What I love about taqwa, what I love about clapping my hands is it doesn't matter if you speak English. It doesn't matter if you speak Spanish. It doesn't matter if you speak at all. Every tongue, every nation, every tribe may not be able to communicate tongue to tongue, but we can still put our hands together and Every person understands that what we're doing is celebrating. And I don't know about you, but I'm celebrating not a, a, not a ball going to a goal, not a ball going into a basket, not a, not a Congress or a president. I'm saying the earth still is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They that inhabit it and they that dwell there within. So I give him my taqwa praise because he's mine. And these promises are mine. Psalm 47, clap your hands, all you people. This is not a suggestion. This is not with conditions. And then, let's, take, let's go to language class. You ready? And. And shout unto God with the voice of tri This doesn't mean just shout unto God. But the voice, the level, the decibel of my shout is as it relates to my victory. So I raise my voice with a voice of victory. I don't raise my voice with a voice of frustration, a voice of fear, a voice of insecurity, a voice of intimidation, but I shout not to my neighbor, not to the preacher, not to the rhythm of the music, y'all don't hear what I'm saying, not to the atmosphere of the church, but I give God my shout. Because I believe I am prophesying my victory. Amen. Psalm 47, verse 1, is in light of Psalm 46, the whole chapter. This entire chapter center, centers around two thoughts 
God is my refuge, and he is my deliverer. He is my refuge, and he has delivered me. The end of Psalm chapter 46 tells us that he literally snaps the arrow, the spear, across his knee. He breaks the spear that was coming against me in half. Okay, y'all don't believe me, so let's look at it. Look at this. Well, I'm feeling frisky. Here we go. God is our refuge and our strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even the earth will be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and tr be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of our God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High God. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. Here it is. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in two, and he burns the chariots in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. David is telling you he's going to snap the bow. He's going to break the spear. He's going to burn the chariots that have been raging against God's people. And in light of his deliverance and his refuge, you ought to clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of victory. Victory because he's our refuge. Victory because he's our deliverer. Has God ever been a refuge for you? Has God ever been a deliverer for you? Then you ought to put those hands together. You ought to taqua and shout with triumph. I hope you hear what I'm saying today. I was up early this morning sitting in my office, and look at this. All of chapter 46 is talking about refuge and deliverance, refuge and deliverance, refuge and deliverance. And then we move into verse 40, 47, verse number 1, that you and I are to shout with a voice of triumph. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said this. You tell somebody is a shout away from your next chapter. You are one shout away from your next. He's about to turn the page. You've been in the chapter of sickness, but you're one shout away from the chapter of victory. I don't know who that's for. You've been in the chapter of depression, but you're one shot away from the next chapter of joy that is unspeakable, that is full of glory. You're one shot away from your next chapter. This word in the Hebrew, while clap is taqwa, the word shout in the Hebrew is ruah. And watch this. It literally means to tear down, to demolish all that the enemy has assigned against me. I clap my hands because of what God is doing. But I lift my voice in shouts of victory because it tears down what the enemy is doing. This ruah is found famously in Joshua chapter 6, verse 16. For seven days they've been walking around the, the walls of Jericho. For six of those days they've said nothing. They remain silent. They are militant. They are military. They are men. They want a war. They want to fight. And for six days they had to circle a promise that they could not attain and keep their mouth shut the whole time. 
Day one, they walk around their promise, but they say nothing. Day two, they walk around their promise, and they say nothing. Day three, they walk around their promise, and they say nothing. Ladies, listen to me. Be careful when your man gets quiet. Just because he's quiet doesn't mean he's not thinking. Just be, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Just because he's being quiet doesn't mean he's not being strategic. It may be the best thing for him to do is to keep his mouth shut so that when he does speak, there's a breakthrough that takes place. When he does speak, there's a breakthrough. There's a victory that comes. with. And for seven days, they've walked around. And here they are on the seventh day. They're walking seven times around it. Can you feel the crescendoing of their frustration? Can you feel the crescendoing of why in the world do I have to walk around this promise when I can possess this promise? Why do I have to walk around this obscurity? Why do I have to walk around this, this oppression? Why do I have to walk? Can you imagine the people in Jericho have seen them for an entire week? weak walk around saying nothing. Can you hear the taunts and the slander of their adversaries? And what God tells them to do through the prophet Joshua, through the deliverer of Joshua, look at this. He tells them in verse number 16 and 17, he says, listen, when we get to the seventh time, you and I are going to shout. Why are we going to shout? Because we're going to ruah, for God has given us the city. We're going to shout because God is about to give us the city. We're not going to have to fight for it. We're not going to have to tear down this wall for it. We're going to shout with the voice of triumph, and this shout is going to tear down the walls. It's going to tear down the walls of oppression. It's going to tear down the walls of depression. We're not going to shout at them. We're going to shout to God, and God is going to bring the victory in our life. What are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying he wanted them to shout because every hindrance and every opposition to the promise of God, look at the scripture, is now going to be doomed. I hear the Lord telling me to tell somebody when you give God a ruah you are prophesying to your future that the doom of this thing that has held you back, the doom of the thing that has tried to oppress you the doom of the thing that has been in opposition to the promise of God is going to be ultimately demolished and destroyed. When Arua says to clap our hands, all, to taqwa all ye people, and rua unto God with a voice of triumph. Joshua had to shout like he was already in victory for the victory to be released. How can you shout for victory when you haven't seen it yet? It's called praise. Listen to me. You got to understand verse number two to appreciate the value of verse number one. Look at this. The reason I can shout in victory is because the Lord most high is That word in the Hebrew means he's scary good. You don't hear what I'm saying. He is awful good. He is scary good. He's scary to the ones that are in opposition, but he's good to the ones that are in promise. He's scary good. The Lord our God, the most high God, he is awesome. But not only is he awesome, look at this text. He is a great king over what? Over all the earth. Don't you know that the city of Jericho is in the earth? Yes, it's in Israel, but it is in the earth. In other words, the ruler of Jericho is not in charge of Jericho. The mayor of Jericho is not in charge of Jericho. Uh, the president of Jericho is not in charge of Jericho. Let me say it another way. The Congress of the United States is not in charge of the United States. The president of the United States is not in charge of the United States. Uh, let me say it another way. Hamas is not in charge of Lebanon. It, oh, God have mercy. Israel, the children of Israel are not in charge of Israel. No, the earth still is the Lord and it still has a king. And even pagan gods are territorial in nature. But our God, he reigns over all the earth. He reigns over all 
Hallelujah. And he is the king of every king. And he is the Lord of every Lord. And I'm thankful that he's mine and I'm his. Is there anybody grateful today? If you're grateful today, you ought to give him a taqwa praise. But if you're fighting all hell in your life, you ought to shout like you're in victory. that scripture right there. I was about to run off this stage, but I can't do it. That Bible tells us that he is the great king over He's the great king over Afghanistan. He's the great king over Albania, Al Algeria, Angolia, Antarctica, Argentina, Aruba, Australia, Austria, the Bahamas, Bangladesh, Belgium, Belize, Bermuda, Bolivia, Botswana, Brazil, Bulgaria, Cambodia, Cameroon, Canada, the Cayman Islands, Chad, Chile, China. Colombia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Costa Rica, Croatia, Cuba, Cyprus, the Czech Republic of Denmark, over the Dominican Republic, over Ecuador, over Egypt, over El Salvador, over Ethiopia. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? He's God over the Fiji, over Finland, over France, over Georgia, over Germany, over Ghana, over Greece. future and he's the king over your right now somebody ought to shout because that thing which has been held up God is about to give you the city God is about to give you that healing God you ought to shout because God is about to give you the financial breakthrough you ought to shout because he's about to turn around that marriage you ought to shout because he's about to give you your joy to give you the I dare somebody to give God a taqwa and a This is my command. Do you hear what I'm saying? It is not conditional on whether I feel like it or whether I don't. Somebody ought to clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of
Jesus. Slip up those hands and honor him all over this room. Slip up your hands and honor him. Just honor him. Just honor him. Until every plan that the enemy has is torn down in your life. He's still a way maker. He's still a miracle worker. Ooh, this is for somebody. He's still a promise keeper. He's still the light in your darkness. That's who he is. How could I not praise him? How could I not praise him? How could I not praise him? That's why I'm praising. He never stops. No, he never stops, never stops, never stops. No, no. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Matthew, go back to the last verse of Joshua 6. I don't know who this is for today. Look at this. Joshua said, shout, for God has given you the city. Now look at the next verse. First word. Now. said, I want you to prophetically praise me. And what drove the people's praise was their prophecy. But what drove their victory was their praise. There was a, now the city shall be doomed by the Lord. The now was not released before the praise. The now was released after the praise. What am I saying? I'm saying that somebody's victory is right under your nose. Somebody's deliverance is right under your nose. I I grew up with a particular type of detergent. We were so Pentecostal that even our laundry detergent was Pentecostal. It was called Shout. And they had a slogan. 
there's some things that you may not be able to wash out. You might have to shout it out. There are some things you may get to cry out. There are some things you might be able to clap out. But underneath great oppression, underneath great hindrance from the promise of God in your life, you may not get to cry that one. You may not get to whisper that one. You may have to ratchet that thing up to the next level. And there's only some things that are going to come out until you shout them. I want to do something different. Drop me back to the one. And, and just leave it there. Listen. When you get caught in moments like this, it would be so easy for me to play to your emotions. When you get in atmospheres like this and the charge of the room is there, it would be easy to carry over to emotionalism. I don't want you to be emotional. I want you to be intentional. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Taqwa and Ruah is not Pentecostal or charismatic. It is Bible. I could crank this thing up and pull this thing to a fevered pitch. And I got enough people in this room that know how to dance. They will tear this place to pieces. And before long, you, you, even the most introverted person, if I, uh, mercy, I didn't know I could do that. I'm not trying to hook you with emotionalism. Here's why. Because emotionalism doesn't change anything. It gives you a great feeling but it doesn't shift anything. You can clap and you can shout, but if your heart is not postured in praise, it's emotionalism. I'm not trying to help you get emotional. I want your reaction to come from the overflow of your praise posture. If there is a promise that God has spoken over you, over your house, that you have yet to see, that is the time to taqwa. And you clap it down. If you have found yourself under great attack, you found yourself always fighting in war, and it's one battle after the next battle. And the enemy is trying to waylay against you. You ought to put with that taqwa a ruah and shout until the wall falls. And shout until the breakthrough comes. Shout until you feel the shift in the atmosphere. Until everything that is opposing the plan of God for you, until you step into your healing, until you step into your deliverance, until you step into your joy, ah, you ought to lift your voice with a shout of triumph. I want you to praise him with prophecy. I want you to prophesy your healing, prophesy to your deliverance. That's what my praise is. Prophesy until they're saved. Prophesy until it's I dare you to lift up your voice. Somebody needs to shout for joy. You need to shout for joy. You ought to shout for joy. Oh, I'm giving you music because I don't want you to be hindered. I dare you to lift your voice in victory until you walk in it. Until your children walk in it. Oh, oh somebody 
so close. I dare you to shout it out. I dare you. I dare you to shout it out until the addiction fades. I dare you to shout it out until the depression goes away. I dare you to shout it until the confusion falls off. Yes, and they- 